So I'm Karen Smith Yoshimura, and I'm here to summarize some of the work I've been doing in, co in collaboration with some of our research library partner staff on organizational identifiers. Now, the impetus for this work it starts with the intense interest in impact. It's actually one of those new vogue terms uh, for any kind of research evaluation. Um, institutions are really interested in demonstrating their impact. Fed funding agencies or any kind of government-led initiatives want to ensure the value of the research that gets funded. But it's really hard to quantify and track and classify what that impact is. And it's really a, a challenge. So one indication of impact that's been referred to is, of course, the annual university rankings. Um, these are three of the more popular ones, the in Times Higher Education and QS and the Academic Ranking of World Universities. And research institutions, especially research libraries, pay a lot of attention to these. In fact, I've even noticed that some universities even incorporate raising their university ranking in their strategic plans. Now, all three of these use citations as a factor in determining the rankings. And this type of ranking makes it really important to not only correctly attribute the work to the author, but to correctly attribute the author's institutional affiliation. You want to make sure that that's correct. So, what to do? Well, during ALA, I've been in more sessions about identifiers and then I have fingers on my hand. I mean, everybody's been talking about identifiers. So dear to my heart. Um, but these are my definitions. These are the definitions that we've been using in the working group. When we talk about identifiers, we're talking about a unique, persistent, and public URI associated with a digital object. It's resolvable globally over networks, and it's unambiguous to use, find, and identify the resource. So I put up a few examples of what we consider identifiers. The first one is the Library of Congress's id.look.gov. The second one is from the International Standard Name Identifier um, database, that's ISNI. The third is the Virtual International Authority File, or VF. And the fourth one is the Wikidata um, URI. Wikidata is the source of all the different languages of Wikipedia that you might have been exposed to. In this case, all four identifiers identify the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also known as MIT, also known as Massachusetts Kulkadaikaku, also known as, also known as, also known as, also known as a number of different labels in various languages. So when we talk about, this is Daniel Hook's slide. He's from Symplectic Elements. And he refers to identifiers as the glue for institutions and funder systems. So researchers interact with many internal and external systems. And it's really important to have machine-readable data structures and unique identifiers for both authentication, validation, deduplication, and to enable data to be trusted and reused at a network um, scale. So it doesn't matter if somebody refers to MIT or Massachusetts Institute of Technology or some other kind of label if you're all using the same identifier across systems. So we organized the OCLC Research Task Force on Organizations in ISNI. It's a large group. Um, Four countries are represented, Australia, US, the UK, and the Netherlands. Um, it includes a representative from COSRE. Um, COSRE is the Consortia for Advancing Standards in Research Administration. Admi uh, sorry, I'll say that more slowly. Consortia Advancing Standards in Research Administration Information. That's why it's called COSRE. Um, it's an international nonprofit dedicated to reducing the administrative burden on researchers and improving business intelligence capacity of research institutions and funders. Um, we've been, they also had a working group going on at the same time as ours on organizational identifiers. So we shared a number of our use cases um, and the working group is producing some sample records to demonstrate the use case. We've come out with 23 recommendations for the system. Um, search guidelines, and an outreach document specifically targeted for academic administrators on both the importance of why they should be interested in organizational identifiers and why um, they might want to consider using ISNI or becoming a member of ISNI. 
So as I mentioned, Casre had already had a working group coming up as we were organizing this new one. Another driver for this new working group was a previous report, also from a working group, um, on research identifiers. Um, this was published in 2014, Registering Researchers and Authority Files. And when you're dealing with research identifiers, um, one of the most important things to disambiguate names is affiliation. And so one of the questions was, well, what is the affiliation? Is it always at the university level? Is it at the department level? Is it at the school level? What to do with that? So we started a new group, it started September of 2014, and one of the first tasks was, well, what are the use cases? So yes, institutions want to track all of their scholarly output. They want to track their research groups, which may comprise staff from multiple institutions, including theirs. For some members, like in Australia and Europe, national assessments reporting is really important for them because they get national funding depending on their ranking. So we don't have that yet, at least in the US. Um, but we do want to track funding. We want to be able to validate affiliation. And as I mentioned before, disambiguating names is really important. Um, but you also want to correctly identify those researchers' affiliations in the various publications. The other thing that became clear is, you know, there's the LC Name Authority file. You have ISNI. There are many different sources which use identifiers, and yet, Many organizations are unaware that they already have an identifier assigned for them. They don't know about it. Um, so when you deal with organizations, I know most of the sessions I've attended have focused on identifiers for names and sometimes subjects, but organizations are particularly complex. And since I know a lot of catalogers in this room, I don't really have to tell you this, but they merge, they split, they acquire, they're acquired. They can have multiple departments and multiple schools. They have hierarchies that change over time. They may have multiple hierarchies. They have multiple branches. And they have multiple locations or countries. And the names of those locations or countries can change over time. Um, it's often unclear when a name change represents a new organization or not. And there's different stakeholders public, um, sorry, different stakeholders perspectives. And a case in point is that publishers, for example, are often most interested in the accounting department of your institution because those are the ones that pay their bills. Um, so what we have done, one of the reasons, for those who don't, um, haven't been familiar with the International Standard Name Identifier, or ISNI, is it is an international standard, and it has many different sources, not just from the library domain, but also trade sources, rights organizations, encyclopedias, although it, research um, and cultural institutions um, it do represent a major domain. And it represents a bridging mechanism. Um, it's a way of bringing together and linking multiple identifiers for the same entity. In fact, that UK GIST CASRE Working Group on Organizational Identifiers I referred to earlier came to the conclusion that the most desirable future for the, the most desirable vision for the future would be for ISNI to emerge as a strong, sustainable, and internationally well-supported baseline or bridging ID. So right now, ISNI has over 500,000 organizations that have these public identifiers. And they're used not only by people who use ISNI directly, but ORCID. Many of you I know are either using or thinking of using ORCID for your researchers. And ORCID does use ISNI's for organization names. There are links to and from the Virtual International Authority file between ISNI and VF. And there's links in Wikidata. So for this example, again, I know in the back of the room you can't see it. You'll have to take my word for it that this is a wiki data entry for the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and it includes, as one of the identifiers for it, an ISNI. From that, for every Wikipedia in every language that uses an authority template, that is repeated. So in the English Wikipedia, you'll find the same ISNI for the, its entry for the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and if you go to the Korean one, you'll also find the same ISNI. So regardless of the language, you can see what the identifier is, even though the text strings are very different. 
So one of the ways that we've tried to illustrate use cases is through these kinds of diagrams. This one was actually diagrammed by one of our members, Kate Barron, at the University of New South Wales. It's a research group. It's the idea is that you often have um, organization type that have multiple links to both persons and other organizations, as well as links to funders. The research group itself can be independent, but each of its members might be affiliated with different institutions. The example provided by our Dutch colleague at Utrecht University was the Netherlands Graduate School of Linguistics. It publishes a series of dissertations and has its own ISNI, but the people that work together in the school are all employees of different Dutch universities. And you can probably think of similar types of examples in your own context. So what we've been doing right now, we started in September 2014, and we are now wrapping up our work. So we're actually in the process of drafting our final report, which we hope to get out in the next few months. Among the recommendations for the ISNI database was to augment the relationship types and display. So for example, the new types, there was already a very long data element set for ISNI, but we recommend that we also need is hosted, hosted by, such as the Hathi Trust, hosted by the University of Michigan, acquired and acquired by. Um, all of you who've been to ALA for several sessions, or several years, know that um, there's a lot of acquisitions that by or is acquired by governed or is governed by, and it's partnered with, um, those kind of new relationships. Um, indicate the organization's own preferred form of name. I mean, if you go look at your own organization in ISNI, you go to isni.org, plug in your organization's name, it's quite possible you're gonna see a long list of names, and because they come from various sources. And we think it's really important to flag how the institution itself wants to be known and flag that in some way. And it could be by language, because if you think of some of the countries where English or French, it's, it has multiple languages as the official languages. So for the Library and Archives Canada, they might very well say, this is our preferred name in French, this is our preferred name in English, as an example. Um, we want to publish the ISNI ontology so people can understand it better. Um, it already uh, publishes as linked data in RDF, but we think it should have other linked data options, um, create a better e uh, end user input form for the organizations. Um, as I said, we are already working on an outreach document that we would hand off to them um, to either revise or distribute and to engage organizations to maintain their public identity. I mean, it's really important that the organizations themselves, you know, take ownership of how their organization is represented in a linked data world. Um, and therefore to work and collaborate with Disney to diffuse corrections. And with that, I'm done. <laughs>